this week on Arts Insight. Painting in the name of love. Something bright, hand-painted, colorful for people to enjoy where they drive around or stuck in traffic or what have you. A new perspective of the world around us. I wanted to show these people that this stuff exists. I mean, this stuff is here. It's beautiful scenery just out your doorstep. Life lessons through sculpting. Sculpting taught me about patience, and it also taught me a lot about life. And we check out one of America's largest art collections. He was extraordinarily aware of the light at all times, and his painting is infused with that perception. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight, I'm Ernie Manus. Today we're standing in front of a giant selfie along Blackshear Elementary in the Third Ward. So what makes a mural a selfie? Artist Anat Ronan stops by to tell us in just a few minutes. But first, Valentine's Day may be just around the corner, but Houston artist Wiley Robertson is working to keep love in the air and on signs and walls all year round. A lot of people have come to me from seeing the love signs and told me stories about it's made them happier. I don't know, use it for their wedding photo or something like that. But that really makes me happy as an artist. It makes me want to do more stuff. That's, I don't know, a compliment that I love to hear is people recognizing my work and seeing it around town. My name is Wiley Robertson. I'm a working artist, muralist. Lived in Houston my whole life. I've always loved positive artwork. So many signs in Houston, like strip centers and just lots of ugly signs. I thought it'd be nice to do like some positive reminders around the city. Something bright, hand-painted, colorful for people to enjoy where they drive around or stuck in traffic or what have you. When I first started doing the street art, like most stickers and like posters I saw were all black and white. So I thought it'd be different if I could do something that was like really colorful and really bright. That would help make it stick out, or at least people can recognize my style just from the colors, sort of. So by doing that, I was able to reach people I would never reach before, because Houston is a huge city. And that's really what excites me a lot, is this new people seeing my work. I mean, when I first started doing it, it was all just the uh, signs. Two years ago, I started doing more big love installations. Now that I've gotten permission from some people to paint their walls. And that's been a lot of fun to do. Uh, it's bigger, bigger and brighter and better is always more fun. Yeah, most visible works on uh, 59 by Wendy's, right off the freeway by Maine. Dandy Warhol was running a gallery there and he had mentioned it to me like in passing, I think at some point that if I wanted to, I could get up there and paint it. So eventually I picked him up on that and uh, got all the ladders required and equipment and got up there and painted it, and it's a lot of fun because I'm sure at least a half a million people see it a, a day. Some people can see the word love and probably bad connotations or whatever, broken up recently or something like that. But yeah, like there's so much stuff in Houston, there's such a daily grind that people get caught up in work and life. It's nice just to have a little subtle reminder hidden, sprinkled throughout Houston. We at least want to cover my artwork throughout Houston and just uh, continue to improve my work as a muralist, continue to promote myself. I hope uh, you know, that the other, the younger generation gets inspired and does even more awesome stuff than I'm doing and people I know. And keep seeing more graffiti and street art. Love. If you loved Wiley's work, you can learn more about him at WileyRobertson.com. Welcome to the Third Ward, where Anat Ronan refers to the mural behind me as a selfie. And joining me now is Anat to explain why that is and what inspired her work here at Blackshear Elementary. Hello there. Hi. First of all, very impressive piece. The kids must love it. 
Thank you. Yes, they do. It's funny because they, they seem to be very uh, shy. Like if they know somebody that is painting at all, they would mock him. But at the same time, they would come to me and ask to be included in the mural. So <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's, it's both ways. So that but takes us back to the very beginning, that these are real people. This does truly represent the community. Yeah. Where did they come from? How did you pick who's here? From the street. Yeah. Yeah. When, um, when I paint, people come by and I ask them if they wanted to be included. And uh, if they say yes, I take a picture of them and I include them uh, afterwards. Now I have a little too many people. So it's a little bit of a problem because I'm disappointed. I'm going to disappoint people. Um, but um, yeah, I have enough of just passers-by that came by either by car or by bicycle or by foot and they're, yeah. So now you call this or have called it a giant selfie. Explain that to me. Basically, it's uh, people from the community. It's not a selfie, but uh, there's so many people looking at, you know, it resembles that picture that you take with your cell phone. Doesn't just resemble it. You've got the cell phone taking yeah, a picture yeah, down at the one, end like a yeah, true selfie. Yeah, one woman, uh, <laughs> she had the, the pink and, and I just had to um, have her, you know, holding it. Uh, towards me uh, and I'm gonna be putting myself too so it's gonna be technically yes it's gonna be a selfie yes <laughs> yes but uh, because you know I wanted to um, somehow put myself in in this mix so yeah that, that's how it became a selfie and it looks like you know the pose that we would be doing if we take a People selfie. People should come and take selfies in front of your giant selfie. They do. They there do. Let's take it all the way back the idea to put it here in the first place why is it here and what is it supposed to do for the community? Um, it started uh, from the, the big um, issue that was with Dodson Elementary last year. They closed that, that school. It's not no longer Dodson Elementary. And they transferred the school over here. And um, I painted a mural over there, which is right by the 45, and they liked it. And so when the principal came here, she was like, well, uh, I have this huge wall. Why don't you come here and suggest what you would do with it? So it became just anybody. Compared to the size of this mural, we're pretty small. It's hard to draw that. You're up so close. Perspective must be a challenge. How do you do it? I specifically work with grid. Um, that is basically uh, putting lines or squares on the wall and transferring uh, the design from paper to the wall square by square. And it makes it easier because you don't have to see the entire picture to do it, but you take it one square at a time. Of course, I, I step back and look at it, but it gives you the, 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 the ability to transfer it without uh, any special technique or any special machinery or projection or anything like that. The winter months slowed you down a little bit, but it's far from done, correct? Right. How far are you going with it? Uh, all the way. All the way to the end of the wall? Yes. And how many more people do you think this will encompass? I think I'm going to put 20 more. Well, to find out more about you and more about your work, where can people visit you online? www.anatronan.com Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. During the interview, you saw some time-lapse video of Anat working on her mural. Now, out in Sacramento, Justin Majeski uses time-lapse to show viewers frame by frame that beauty surrounds us. Yeah, I try and give the viewer, obviously, my point of view. I mean, that's what makes art so wonderful, is that it's completely subjective. I remember seeing a photo that was on a National Geographic cover. And uh, you might know it, it's kind of famous. It was a young woman from another country, and uh, her eyes, her green eyes, I remember being about 12 years old, and just looking at that photo, and it made me feel something different inside. I don't know, it made me feel in a way that I've never felt by looking at a photograph. And I didn't even know that that was possible. I didn't know that you could look at an image and it would change your outlook. And uh, from that day, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to produce content that would change people's outlooks on their lives. I've always liked video and I've always liked photography, so time lapse was a perfect like marriage between the two. You have to pretty much do as much pre-production as you do shooting. So equal time, 50-50, knowing where you're going, why you're going there, what time of the day you're going. Uh, those are all huge factors in what I do. There was an evening I wanted to go shoot some starscapes, and there was supposed to be a chance of thunderstorms. And I knew the Milky Way came out at about 10 o'clock, and then I knew that the storms were supposed to roll in at about uh, 11.30 or 12 o'clock, I think. And I knew that the combination was there for something really interesting and dynamic to happen. 
So we did it. We put everything in the car, drove you know two hours, two and a half hours to Emerald Bay, and a shot of time lapse. And sure enough, Milky Way comes out, and then all of a sudden these big storm clouds come in, just lightning and thunder all over the place. That's a good example of pre-planning, pre-cognitive thought into what you're gonna go actually shoot and having nature perform for you. I mean, it just all came together. That's definitely my favorite shot I've ever shot. When I arrive on a scene, I like to kind of look over the whole scene. I'll kind of survey and pick my composition on what I think is the strongest, and that's, you know, obviously something that's subjective to the artist. I'll look at my rig, and I'll decide, okay, yeah, this is what I want, and then I'll go ahead and I'll start the time lapse. Every time it's different. It depends on the subject matter of what I'm shooting, of how long I'll shoot. Night scenes sometimes are up to eight hours. Sometimes the cityscapes are 20 minutes. When I made the Sacramento film, immediately it hit me that there's like this really beautiful contrast between the rural outlying areas of the country that are just beautiful and morning sunrise and the sunflowers and all of the agriculture and you know just 10 minutes outside of the bustling city this exists. So once it got released, my goal for the film was to get 50,000 online views in a month. And I thought that goal was like really attainable because it's a city and there's people in the city. My, my expectations were exceeded in the second day. It started getting posted on other blog sites, F-Stoppers, CNN, uh, you know, it was kind of everywhere for a little while there. And, uh, it was really humbling and exciting. And I like to believe I was maybe born an artist. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, my grandfather and great-grandfather were award-winning photographers in Baltimore, and my grandfather used to shoot for the Baltimore Zoo and all that stuff, and so I kind of grew up around photography. He had a photography studio in his basement that I would always go down and Google at while I, when I was young, you know. I, I heard a good quote once, and the difference between a professional photographer and an amateur photographer is professionals already made all the mistakes. And uh, I take that to heart, and I think that's completely true, because I have failed a lot, and you will too, you know, but that's part of learning. Me and my wife this summer are gonna go travel around the western seaboard and we're gonna shoot a bunch of time lapses and photos while we're out there camping and just keep putting more content out there, more inspiring content. A lot of people spend a lot of time in their homes and they don't get really to go out and appreciate like a nice sunset or sunrise or the stars or things like that. And I wanted to show these people that this stuff exists. I mean, this stuff is here. It's beautiful scenery just out your doorstep. And uh, I wanna inspire people to go outside and enjoy nature because it's all around us. To see more of Justin's work, visit Variant3.com. Up next, Las Vegas is best known for showgirls and casinos, but a wide array of creative professionals, like sculptor Sharon Gainsbourg, also call Sin City home. My name is Sharon Gainsbourg. I'm a sculptor, teacher, and creativity coach. I have been sculpting now for 40 plus years. I have been in Las Vegas coming up on nine years. This is a sculpture that I did recently. It was a very thin piece. This stone comes from southern Utah. Here we have a piece that is local and this is called root beer or Nevada alabaster. I'm originally from Philadelphia, where I started sculpting in clay when I was 20. I stayed with clay for 10 years. Someone saw my clay work and said, oh, you have to take stone. And I bought a piece of stone and three hits on the stone, and that was it. It was a relationship that I formed with this material that's millions of years old instantaneously. This stone, also alabaster, comes from Sicily. 
This is called Eternal Light, and it's actually my most recent sculpture. To sculpt, you have to be very committed. It's almost like having a fire in your belly. And you also have to be very patient. Sculpting taught me about patience, and it also taught me a lot about life. Because when you're sculpting and a piece falls off that you weren't counting on and your design is ruined, you have to dig deeper to come up with a better design to incorporate the area that's missing. But that's what we have to do in life. Something happens, you have to take a detour. There are five basic steps in sculpting stone. First is blocking out your form. The second is refining it. The third is dry sanding it. The fourth is wet sanding. And the fifth step is putting some type of liquid sealer and buffing it. This is an automatic power driven chisel. This is gonna make a little bit of dust. My favorite step is the conceptualization of finding the forms to express what I wanna say. The process is fluid when you just go with whatever your intuitive self is telling you to do. Well, if I had to put a label on the type of work that I do, I call it abstract realism. You can always find a realistic form somewhere buried in, in the abstract forms. And I like to do that because I want people to use their intuitive sense or an emotional connection to the work. Welcome to the studio where all the magic happens. These are my rock stars. I'm a teacher coming up on about 37 years. What I tell my students is, you come here three hours once a week, but while you're doing your job or if you are retired, be more aware of being in the now. Just take a few minutes every day and look at your surroundings and tune in to what's around you. Look at color, smells, form, and you will start developing a language. Did I have this shape in mind? Yeah. No, it's an abstract. It was one solid, almost square piece. And what Sharon is teaching me is to continue to round it and get rid of the flat parts. And so as I work, I see. I've enjoyed every moment of working on this piece. Even the painstaking parts of the sanding and things like that have really been a joy. So in the process, all your troubles melt away. I believe that we are all creative, but most of the time the focus on one's life is providing um, an income and we put creativity aside. In every way, it is worth, I mean, I couldn't be paid enough to have the fulfillment and the joy that I have out of this. I just feel alive again. You know, there's something that attacked that was inside of me, a passion of some sort that I just never realized until I started sculpting. I can barely tie a ribbon, I can barely tie a knot, but I can sure bang on a rock <laughs> and create something. <laughs> To me, it's a spiritual thing because uh, God chips at us to try to make us come out beautiful. And it's just too amazing for me. There's a universal consciousness that Stone has. And if I told students when they took the class, they would say, cuckoo. But they get it once they start working with it. When a person is dealing with frustrations in life, they're going through rough times, and we all have had it. Come here and take it out on the stone. Be kind to each other, but take it out on the stone. Beat the heck out of the stone. People need to get in touch with a piece of their soul that they never knew existed. When you believe in something and you stay with it, and you believe in yourself for so many years, uh, the rewards are great. What I'd like people to know about me as an artist is that I've always lived 
my truth, and you see that in my work. For more information, visit GainsburgStudio.com. Finally tonight, we began the show talking about painting, and that's how we're going to end it. It's time to visit the Parish Art Museum in Long Island, where they're celebrating the life and art of American Impressionist painter William Merritt Chase. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman Chief Curator of Art and Education here at the Parish Art Museum. Our new Herzog and Dimeron Design Building is located in Watermill, New York, a hamlet just to the east of Southampton Village on Long Island's East End. This is the first time that we've had dedicated space to show our permanent collection and to have a dedicated gallery to the work of William Merritt Chase. The parish collection is really notable for its range of work from all periods, especially from the Shinnecock paintings when he was here, and is the largest collection in a public institution in America. William Merritt Chase had a long and rich relationship to the east end of Long Island. You might even say that he staked his claim to this landscape early on and that he saw more possibilities in it than the untutored eye. He once said that he could find pictorial gold in the dross of the Shinnecock Hills. It was in many ways a scrubby landscape, one that had been greatly overlooked by many other artists. He first came out to Eastern Long Island in 1881 to sketch on plein air. Chase adopted not so much what you might call the techniques of the French Impressionists, but certainly their ideas of coming out and painting modern life. In 1891, uh, two civic-minded uh, women in the Southampton area decided they'd like to start a plein air school of art. Chase was a very well-known teacher at the Art Students League. He was a renowned portrait painter, and he readily accepted their invitation to come out and in 1891 be the founding director of the Shinnecock Hills Summer School of Art. By the next summer, a house had been built for him, this beautiful Dutch colonial revival, shingle style that's become very famous and ubiquitous here on the East End, and his whole family came out. He taught here till 1902, and then the family continued to use the house in Shinnecock really up to Chase's death in 1916. The William Merritt Chase Archives at the Parish Art Museum is a repository of documents, letters, and most especially 600 photographs that really document the artist's life. Many of the photographs were, we know, taken by Mrs. Chase. She was an amateur photographer. They give an extraordinary glimpse into what you might call a Gilded Age summer, but really more importantly, into Chase's life and work. These photographs particularly are extremely important because many of the same scenes that Chase depicted are visible in the photographs. Chase is indelibly associated with the paintings that he did here in the Shinnecock Hills. Our own painting, 1895, The Bayberry Bush, is really emblematic of these, and he really did find pictorial gold in this scrubby landscape. I think one of the most interesting things about that painting is, of course, the presence of the house that they lived in, uh, the three daughters. It is a complete look at the artist and his life, I think, having the domestic realm, the landscape realm. There is perhaps no better entry into the creative life of William Merritt Chase than this painting we see here, Alice in the Shinnecock Studio from around 1900. Alice Judene Chase, his oldest daughter, was often depicted by Chase in his paintings. Alice is really a surrogate for the viewer, inviting us into the rarefied atmosphere of the artist's studio. While the nominal subject of the painting is the studio, the true theme is painting itself. Here we see so many objects that become a self-portrait for the artist. The Shinnecock painting on the easel, the luminous glow of the bric-a-brac that he collected, his upended paint brushes, the sketch of Velasquez in the upper left, and the light coming through the studio window. It's a complex fusion of art with family, landscape, and the material world. I think Chase was very much a student, you might say, of the light here on the East End. 
He was extraordinarily aware of the light at all times, and his painting is infused with that perception. We would welcome your visit when you're out on the east end of Long Island to come to the museum in Watermill, New York, just to the east of Southampton Village. For more on the museum, go to parishart.org. And that's a wrap for this edition of Arts Insight. Be sure to join us next week as we feature more insightful profiles of artists from Houston and beyond. From Blackshear Elementary in the Third Ward, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.